Morton Church family. Thank you, uh, Lou, for sharing as well. And I just love how that emphasis on the church as a family. Like, do we think of that all the time as we are a family bought at the highest price by the blood of Jesus, bought redeemed? Many of us here, maybe we thought we'd never talk to somebody else here in this place, and we're all here because of one thing, because of Jesus uniting us together. And that is an amazing amazing thing that only God can do through His Son, Jesus. If you're new here this morning, we're glad you're here. Thank you for coming. We'd like to welcome you. And uh, please stick around later. We have ice cream later, which is awesome. Awesome time to fellowship and to get to know one another a little better. So please stay for that. And this morning, we're going to be continuing through our journey in 1 Samuel. We've been following Saul. We've been following David. So we'll continue that this morning, and we're also going to have an emphasis on missions this morning. So taking the good news of Jesus across the street or across the world to those who don't know him or don't know him enough yet. So one way you can participate in that is we'd like to give you an opportunity to give towards our sending fund, which we use to send people from our congregation, from our community, on mission across the world with the good news of Jesus. Um, there's details on how to do that in your bulletin if you'd like to, but most importantly, I'd just like to encourage us all to live on mission right where we're at, whatever season we're at in our lives now, and to ask Jesus where he would have us go with the good news of him, whether it's across the street or across the globe. So we'll dive into that a little more this morning. But let's just pray one more time. Dear Jesus, we thank you that you're here this morning. Lord, I don't want to talk about you like you're not here in this room because you are. By the gift of your spirit, you are here. And so, Lord, I pray that you'll speak to each and every one of our hearts this morning. Lord, you came. We had nothing to offer you. We still have nothing to offer you. But you gave your son the highest price for each and every one of us here and for everyone in the world who hasn't heard of you yet. And Lord, you're just yearning for them to come home to you. So Lord, I just pray that you will give us courage to be used in whatever way you would use us right where we're at, or to leave everything to go where you call us. Because Lord, we love you and you are worth it. Lord, I just pray that you'll settle me. I pray that there'll be your word spoken this morning and not mine, that you'll speak to each of our hearts and that we will not leave here the same. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So the title of this morning the title of the message this morning is Sticking Your Neck Out. And you see a picture of a turtle there, or maybe it's a tortoise, I don't know. But we will, uh, we'll explain that a little more later. Um, and we're going to look at, in just a few minutes here, we're going to look at David, when he stuck his neck out for people who had nothing to offer him. And then after that, we're going to hear from a few missionaries, a few people from our congregation, from among us who have stepped out of their comfort zones stuck their necks out for others as well. And I hope we can get a sense of just how ordinary these people are. No offense, those of you who are sharing. But through the Spirit living inside of us, God equips each of us to share the good news that we've received so we can freely share it with others. Right? So please don't be offended by referring to you as ordinary. <laughs> my, my question for us this morning is in our daily lives, our walk with Jesus, are we cultivating a willingness to stick our necks out for others who don't have anything to offer us, just like Jesus did? And if we are, or if we take that step to do that, then where is God calling us? Not when or if, but where is God calling us with the good news of Jesus across the street or across the globe? So just keep that in mind as we walk forward, and let's look at David first here at 1 Samuel. We're on 23 this week. If I can get this to go. Might need some help, Connor. There we are. So this is 1 Samuel 23. It says, Then they told David, saying, Look, the Philistines are fighting against Keilah. I'm going to say Keilah. I don't know if that's the right way, but that's how I'm going to say it. And they are robbing the threshing floors. Therefore David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go and attack these Philistines? And the Lord said to David, Go and attack the Philistines and save Keilah. 
So here, I'll stop right there for a minute. David, at this point, he's in hiding, right? He's not on the war path. He's not on the throne, right? He's been anointed as king, but he's not there yet. David's in hiding from Saul. And David sees people suffering. He sees people with an enemy at the gates, and he sees that they are in need of saving someone to help them. They have nothing to offer David, but he wants to stick his neck out for them. Because there are people who need him saving, and he has it in his power to help them this morning. And the Lord says, go and do it. But David's men said to him, look, we are afraid here in Judah. How much more then if we go to Keilah against the armies of the Philistines? Then David inquired of the Lord once again. And the Lord answered him and said, arise, go down to Keilah, for I will deliver the Philistines into your hand. And David and his men went to Keilah and fought with the Philistines, struck them with a mighty blow, and took away their livestock. So David saved the inhabitants of Keilah. So yeah, again, David was in hiding here. He's in Judah, which is quite a ways away from where Saul's headquarters was, you could say. And David wants to stick his neck out for these people. They have nothing to offer him. There's no political gain he can get from these people. There's, they're not, like, if he saves them, then he'll win the, their favor, and they'll put him on the throne. Nothing like that. He just sees an enemy at the gates. These people are helpless, harassed, and need someone to help them. And he's willing to do it. And his men are like, look, we're afraid here, away from hiding from Saul. And you want to stick our necks out, go into pitched battle with the Philistines, closer to Saul's headquarters. They're like, that's, that's crazy. What are you doing? But I love this contrast here. Remember with Saul, when the people grumbled, when the people complained, Saul gave in to the people. David didn't do that here. David, what did he do? It says, then David inquired of the Lord once again. He didn't just give in to the grumblings of the people. He didn't just ask people. He immediately sought the Lord. And the Lord said, go up and I'll deliver them. He stuck his neck out for people who had nothing to offer him. So just like in missions, if introducing people to Jesus was easy, it would be done by now, right? We've been on mission for over 2,000 years, and there's still people who haven't heard the good news of Jesus because it's not easy, it's uncomfortable, and it can even be dangerous sometimes to stick your neck out for the good news of Jesus. If we're going to move forward with the good news of Jesus, we have to be a little bit like a turtle. Okay, so I haven't lost it. Stick with me. I was hoping to have a turtle this morning, and Mac and I tried our hardest all week to find a turtle. Uh, I, been, I was late this morning because I was trying to find one in the swamp, but uh, I couldn't find a turtle for it. So we we'll just have to have to explain it. So, and this I won't take credit for this. This was Chris Lee. Um, he came up with this idea. We were trying to. I came up with this cheesy title, "Sticking Your Neck Out." And they came up with a turtle, which is awesome. So a turtle, think about it. When a turtle's afraid or in danger, it goes inside its shell. But when it's inside its shell, it can't move. A turtle can't move until it sticks its head out of its shell and makes itself vulnerable. So just like in missions, if we're going to move forward with the good news of Jesus, we have to stick our necks out. Be a little vulnerable, uncomfortable, or else we're not going to be able to move forward with the good news of Jesus. So there's a little turtle analogy. Um, but I think it's true, and it's important. It's going to be uncomfortable. So if it wasn't, it'd be done already. So, so far in our story, God's delivered the Philistines into David's hands, right? And if the story ended here, we could start thinking things like, well, yeah, as long as we do what's right, you know, as long as we do the will of God, which is to love Him, to love others, 
everything's going to be sunshine and rainbows, like everything will go the way we want, it'll be smooth and easy, and then we can start thinking like, well, so if things are going well in my life, that's a sign of God's blessing, and if things are going bad, that's a sign of not His blessing. But then that gets sticky when we're doing the right thing, things are getting uncomfortable, things are getting hard, because we're following after Jesus, and then we can feel like, oh, we don't have God's blessing because things aren't going smoothly. The truth is, things can still be very hard. The enemy will push back against us when we follow the will of the Lord sometimes. And we'll read an example of that here uh, in the rest of, not all, but some more in 1 Samuel 23. So after David stuck his neck out, he saved the, the inhabitants of Keilah. And Saul was told that David had gone to Keilah. So Saul said, God has delivered him into my hand, for he has shut himself in by entering a town that has gates and bars. See, Saul's seeing this good thing that's happening. Look, David's trapped. He's in the town. This must be God's blessing, but he's, he's giving me a bone here. Then Saul called all the people together for war to go down to Keilah to besiege David and his men. When David knew that Saul plotted evil against him, he said to Abiathar the priest, Bring the F out here. Then David said, O Lord God of Israel, your servant has certainly heard that Saul seeks to come to Keilah to destroy the city for my sake. Will the men of Keilah deliver me into his hand? Will Saul come down, as your servant has heard? O Lord God of Israel, I pray, tell your servant. And the Lord said, He will come down. And David said, Will the men of Keilah deliver me and my men into the hand of Saul? And the Lord said, They will deliver you. So David and his men, about 600, arose and departed from Keilah, and went wherever they could go. Then it was told Saul that David had escaped from Keilah, so he halted the expedition. So again, this passage shows David had nothing to gain from saving these people of Keilah. Like, they were going to hand him over to Saul when he came after him, right? They weren't going to... There was no benefit for David. But he saw people in trouble. He had the power to do something, so he did it. And it was sticky, right? So he did the will of the Lord, and it was still sticky. So just like his men said, Saul saw right where they were at, and he came after him, or was about to come after him. But the Lord did deliver him. He did get out of Cuba and made it out alive. But it was sticky. It wasn't easy. But David trusted the Lord. He did what was right. did the will of the Lord, even though he knew it could be sticky, just like it was. And trusted the rest to God's hand. And there's so much freedom in that, right? If we start being afraid of the possible outcomes of doing good, of doing the will of the Lord... It can stop us from walking in those steps of things that God's given us an opportunity to help others, to point others towards Him. But David didn't try to predict the future, take that into his hands. He trusted the Lord with that. And I think so often we try to predict the future, whether we think of it that way or not. What if David here in this situation had said, and if I stick my neck out, help these people of Keilah, uh, Saul's going to see me. He's going to come down. I'll be trapped in the city. He'll get me. And then I won't be king anymore. Like God anointed me to be king. And it's not going to happen if I do this. It's just the odds are too great. It's not going to happen. And then the people of Keilah would suffer, would be oppressed by the Philistines, probably killed because of that. But instead, David didn't try to predict the future. Didn't try to predict the outcome. He saw the suffering. He had compassion on them. There's an enemy at the gates. And he went up, he asked the Lord first, and then he went up to save them. He had compassion, he had power to do something about it, and then he trusted God, who had power to save him, if he wanted to, with the rest of the outcome. So we aren't responsible for the future, we we're to be faithful with what's right in front of us, with the steps we can take in front of us. God's called us to proclaim the good news of Jesus. And it can be uncomfortable. We have to stick our necks out of our shell. 
it can strain relationships when you start talking about faith. Like you can be great buddy buddy friends with some people until you start talking about faith and you can fear, feel the tension in the air, right? It can be sticky, it can be uncomfortable. It can strain family relationships. It can be hard at work. But freely we've received when we have nothing to offer Jesus freely we can give. We can proclaim trusting God with the outcome that He can work all things together for good if we trust Him. And when we do that, when we trust God with what says and just are faithful with the steps in front of us, people find life and freedom and hope in Jesus. It's worth being uncomfortable, being vulnerable, sticking our necks out of our shells to see that happen. And that can't happen if we're not willing to do that, right? To stick our necks out. And this, I mean this to be condemning, but it's so sad that there are thousands of people in this country who live next door to Christians, the followers of Jesus, who have never heard the good news of Jesus. I know I've lived next to people I was in Williamsport and other places, and I never got the courage to go and to talk to them directly, intentionally, or shown them through actions, faith in Jesus. And it's so sad. It's a missed opportunity for people to get to know Jesus. And it's true throughout the whole country. There's so many people. Sometimes we focus so much on going overseas or just getting people into the building. We miss people right next door to us every day. It's sad. So church, we have to cultivate a willingness to stick our necks out for people who have nothing to offer us. People who don't think like we do. People who we don't naturally get along with. Because Jesus loves them. He deserves their praises too. We've preached on that before. We've got to cultivate that willingness. Just like David. They had nothing to offer him. Keep on his life at danger. And those people were still going to hand him over to his enemy. And it didn't matter because David didn't let the fear of death keep him from doing good, from doing the will of the Lord. There's so much freedom in that. God bless that. He saved people. He can do that today. So if we are willing or we're willing to cultivate that willingness to go across the street or across the globe. I'd ask you to ask the Lord where, where He would have you go. Not when or if, but where He would have you go with the good news of Jesus. Maybe it's taking brownies across the street, starting a relationship with a neighbor. It might be awkward. Maybe you lived there for three years and never talked to him. But it's going to be awkward, right? Maybe it's calling a family member, someone who doesn't believe, having that awkward conversation that might strain, strain a relationship with or having that hard, awkward conversation about Jesus with a friend. And maybe it's even selling everything, leaving everything you have, and going overseas with the good news of Jesus. But whatever it is, Jesus has done so much more for us. So we can stick our heads out of our shell to take the good news of Jesus to those who need it. So now, those of you that I've asked to share a little bit, you guys can come up. We're going to hear from some people from our congregation who have been willing to stick their necks out, to be uncomfortable with the good news of Jesus, whether in camps or in prisons or just to neighbors or across the sea. Or I guess I don't know how there is not across the sea, really, but out of the country. Um, so yeah, they're going to share with us this morning. Um, and we're going to start with Esther. Hello everybody, I'm Esther Martin, in case you did not know. So, I just, I'll, I'll just go okay. here. So this summer, I was away working at Camp Hebron, which is located about 30 minutes outside of Harrisburg. And it's a really cool place. If you have never been there, or you don't know anything about it, um, getting connected there anyway is super cool. We do lots of ministry. So this summer we were very fortunate um, and we were able to open, unlike a lot of other camps, um, COVID kind of messed up stuff up there. 
But thankfully we were allowed to open and we ran almost a full summer. We had to cut one week off the beginning. But yeah, so we ran almost a full summer. And what that looks like for summer camps there is there's three types of ministries that we mainly do at camp. There's a day camp, which is, is that me? I feel that short. Okay. Oops, sorry. Um, there's a day camp, which is similar to a daycare. So parents can bring their kids and drop them off for the day. And it's basically like we have a summer long VBS for them. Um, so they could come for one week or for the whole summer. Then we have hill camps, which it's just because the cabins are on the hill, is that we call them that. So that'd be cabin camps, um, and we run those every week. And there's adventure camps, regular camps, there's all sorts of things. And then we have family camps, which is retreat style, like families come and they hang out and we run camp things for them. So that's a little bit of what I was doing throughout the summer. And I was asked to share a specific highlight, and I did not pick one. There was a lot of... Um, there was just a lot of different things that happened this summer due to like wearing masks and having to rearrange all of our scheduling due to Corona and the government's um, like regulations that we had to follow. So that made it really tough, but we always have fun at camp no matter what. So we're going to do something kind of fun and this is a full church participation. If you are able, I ask you all to stand and I need Kyle and Mackie to come on up here. We're gonna do a little camp song, okay? This is fun, this is what we do all summer. We sing, we play games, we swim, we do all sorts of stuff. So this is gonna be, I'll like say the first part and then you do the next part. They're like the echo, so you just follow them as the echo. So this is a repeat after me song and a do as I do song, so you have to sing and you have to do as I do. It's how it works or we can't get into dinner or lunch or breakfast. So, okay, I'm just gonna do a few verses, but this will just give you a taste of like a little bit of what we do. Okay, there was a great big moose. He liked to drink a lot of juice. There was a great big moose. He liked to drink a lot of juice. Way oh, way oh. Way up, 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 way send them off to summer camp and it's really sad um, to see that but it's also really good because then we get kids that come back week after week day after day and we get to pour into them and to love them but um, yeah when I was growing up as like a camp kid I did not like camp at all and it was terrible but now that I work at one I absolutely love it and it's a really cool ministry and if you ever get the chance to send your kids to camp or to be a part of a camp ministry do it you won't regret it okay that's all Good morning. Uh, I'm representing the prison ministry, and uh, many of you know I've been doing it for lots of years, like 30, and. Um, 
And when he was talking about sticking out your neck, uh, that's exactly what happened to me. They asked, someone asked me if I would consider doing prison ministry. I said, no. <laughs> and uh, she said, would you just go with me for, for at least for one weekend? And so I did, and you know, I was hooked. I really was. And I went back, and, and I've been doing it every Thursday for the last 30 years. And uh, of course, I haven't been there in five months or so. And uh, so uh, I mostly do the girls. And uh, uh, well, Jamie Brooks had helped me earlier. She isn't right now. And uh, John Hickok and Brad Martin do help me with Sunday night uh, once a month, Sunday night church. And uh, anyway, I meet with the girls. And Studying a book called The Key to Your Expected End, and uh, some of the, the lady that wrote this book, uh, she wants every prisoner in the United States to have this book. And, uh, and uh, the key verse uh, is uh, and it says, For I know the thoughts I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, and to give you an expected end. Jeremiah 29. And uh, they have, the girls have loved this book. It starts out, uh, I wasn't impressed with it the first chapter or two because uh, I felt like they didn't need any ideas of how to commit crimes and watch how to get away from stuff. But uh, as we got in further, they liked it on the journey as the journey the children of Israel had in, in the wilderness and how they were uh, many times after that, they were in captivity, and they uh, relate to that, those scriptures, which has been a, a good, uh, good thing. Uh, this church has uh, given me funds to buy Bibles. I gave every person this 12-step uh, recovery Bible, which uh, is a uh, New Living uh, uh, edition, and, uh, they love it. They've never, girls that have said that uh, they didn't ever read the Bible are into it. They love it. And uh, and also, I just want to give a plug for Vacation Bible School. Uh, when I ask girls what they know about God, and they say, well, I went to Vacation Bible School, and that's where I first learned about God. And uh, so, when we do that here, you know, it does does uh, make a difference in some of their lives. Some of them just are a little late catching on to it. And uh, anyway, uh, I have also had Denny with here, and he does his prison ministry the same as uh, the rest of us, except a little more extensive. And I'm going to let him do it. Good morning. I just have to say that some of the stuff I have to say, Keegan already stole my thunder. <laughs> so it was Holy Spirit that led this today. I have, uh, too, been involved in prison ministry, originally in Bradford County, but also has spread throughout the state. I've been to, uh, I think, 22 out of 27 state prisons visiting men. But uh, I didn't quite come as easily as Fran did. She's the one that actually invited me to come and share some music one time at a Bible study about 25 years ago. And I, I did. And I thought, well, this is interesting. But uh, I kind of, it took me dragging my feet for a couple of years until the Holy Spirit really got hold of me to say to me, well, why not you? And uh, that's, that's history, you know, all these years of just sharing the love of Jesus. I'm not going to give a sermon, but I'm going to talk about three P's today that have, have to do with prison ministry. The first one is power. How many here today believe there's power in the name of Jesus? Would you say amen? Man, there is such power in the name of Jesus. When you come to know Jesus, I, I asked him into my life at the age of 17. I'm now 66. You do the math. It's been a long time. But God's power has been with me throughout my life. He helps me to hang on to prison ministry because it is not easy. It is sticky. 
very sticky at times. It's very hard. But God, when you proclaim the name of Jesus, his word does not return what? Void. In some way, even a small prayer, just visiting the neighbor with the brownies or whatever, and mentioning the name of Jesus and inviting someone to church and sometimes just saying, and I've learned this over here, so can I pray with you? That first night that I stood, I was in Bradford County Jail and they gave me this man that was like six foot five, all tattoos, and I didn't know him from Adam, and he was from the wide listing area, and I'm like thinking, oh, <laughs> what do I say? But you know what? You just say who you are in Christ. When you share the love of Jesus, you just start talking. And that's what I want to encourage each of you today to realize that there are some people, we used to have a pastor at our church named Wilma Hoos at Grover Church, for years, she said, there are certain people out there that will listen just to you, more so than they would to Keegan or Danny or Fran or any of these people up here today. So there's power in the name of Jesus. Be willing to stick our necks out and say, it's not easy. I would just tell you today that Ben nor Keegan are not the only evangelists or pastors in this church. Amen? Everybody is called to the next P word, proclaim, is what you said today. That came to me last night. You know, if I talk to each but everybody here today, you probably, most of you, and some are probably searching too, you would say, yes, I claim Jesus as my Savior. But do you proclaim Him? You tell others what He's done for you in a, in a real practical way? Or, or are you afraid? Fearful. And, and I was. It didn't come easy to share with the men with the tattoos and, They've taught me a lot. <laughs> I've learned a lot. Of, I've heard a lot of foul language. I've heard a lot of, I know a lot about drugs now. Um, but it helps me. It helps me in my walk with people. God has even opened the door for me for over, not quite two years yet, and I have only gone back a couple times since March, but God opened the doors for me to share at a uh, rehab, a uh, secular rehab called uh, White Deer Run down below Williamsport on a bi-weekly basis to give me an hour to share the love of Jesus to these men. And I can tell you so many stories already, but I'm just not going to get into that. But we have, we have power in the name of Jesus. We have the proclamation to proclaim that Jesus is Lord of all. And, you know, your end result isn't to really, I don't think, to actually say what we have in our minds that we need to kneel them down, they need to say the sinner's prayer. Yes, they need to uh, at some point in their life, but to me that isn't really where I'm at in the prison ministry. It's, I just show the love of Jesus, and you know, at some point I have, you know, I've seen so many men's lives transformed, whether I led them personally to Christ or not. Some I have, but to see the results is just astounding, and then to see the horror stories is. I've lost some through death, and some of you would know some of their names from around here. But, believe it or not, some of these men that have lost their, their lives did come to Jesus at some point and uh, died from drug overdoses. So, we have the power, we have the proclama proclamation, and finally, what a believer in Jesus does is we minister, just like it says over there. I love that. I've always loved that ever since I've come here. We minister. You can even put the word prisons in there too, or nursing homes or whatever. But the last word, the P word, is productivity. A, a Christian is productive. Fruits of the Spirit love, joy, peace, kindness, goodness, meekness, gentleness, all that stuff. We can't be, I cannot be productive on my own. If it were up to me, in the, from a human standpoint, I would have given up on this prison and rehab stuff a long time ago. But the power of God in me keeps me going. Amen. And you keep going too, for, for the Lord Jesus. Thank you. Which is like 40 minutes down the road in Trout Run. Uh, it's 
neat things happen there this summer. They only had, we didn't have a lot of camp things happen because of COVID and we were being on the safe side. So we had like eight, or, eight to 10 people on staff and we were just working around camp, taking care of things that needed to be done, like the taking care of the paths or the trails, cleaning that up and making camp look all nice for next year, doing projects we wouldn't normally get to do done, get to do because of camp happening. Um, uh, some of you may have heard about Mount Zion being a thing that camp has an opportunity to you know, take a hold of and uh, sort of have stuff up there uh, that actually got purchased or part of it got purchased a few days ago so camp has now has that and it's pretty exciting to do because more work will now be needed <laughs> so I actually go back to work there so that's pretty neat. Uh, one of my favorite things that we got to do this summer was uh, we don't normally get to like spend as much time with all the staff and like just be in community there. Uh, and that's something that like has gone throughout with me when even like last year at camp and then through with Reach, uh, community has been a pretty big thing for me. Uh, and I got to hang out with this one guy, Brody. Uh, we spent a lot of time together just uh, talking about how our faith came to be and how we were just uh, how the summer came to be for us, like how everything just fell into place, how God uh, brought us there instead of us trying, trying to plan our way there. So that was really, really cool to see how he just laid every step of the way there, even though we had planned to do other things or plan other things during the time that we were going to be there. He uh, really showed us grace and uh, uh, the power of his and glory and everything at camp. Morning. Morning. I sang that song, it says, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. That is so true. So very true. We owe everything to him. And it has led us to live a life of missions. Uh, talking about getting out of the comfort zone, we got out of the comfort zone a number of times uh, with our walk with the Lord. Uh, God doesn't call the element smart, the charismatic. You said that we're calm, cope, folk. Thank God for that. But He calls the faithful because if it was the, that other list, I wouldn't be here. But uh, talk about sticking your neck out. I, I, am, I was the turtle. I was the turtle in high school. If you'd ask my high school mates, uh, did they ever think I would turn out like talkative? They'd say, no way. I was, I was an introvert, and it took a lot for me to break out. Uh, why not you ministries? We started in, uh, we became a ministry in 2014. But in 2012, when we went on a mission trip there, God called me to go back. And in 2013, I went back. I was going back to check out how I can help this uh, future um, orphanage. And I was going to go by myself. And this is where we come together. Because Kyle, at the last minute, Kyle Martin said, hey, I'll go with you. And if it wasn't for Kyle Martin going with us, there would not be a Why Not You Ministries today. Because I went home after, um, after God called me to do this for half a year, I was the turtle hiding my head, not wanting to stick it out, into the, out of my comfort zone. But as we went down there, I sat, I sat on the bed upstairs and I'm thinking about all that had to be done in the building and my knee was just going a mile a minute, which is normal for me. But it was just going a mile a minute. I said, there's no way. I can't do this. This is too much. So I went and talked to Kyle and Kyle says, wait a minute. Let's break this down and look at it piece by piece. He used his pastor's voice. 
You gotta listen to me now. And because of that, we pursued, we stuck our neck out, and we became Why Not You Ministry. Uh, I did that no, a number of times. Why do, we, why do we like to do missions? I'm going to go back to 2000, 2001. I started taking groups down to New York City. And as I had the group from this church down in New York City, I look over out, outside of Madison Square Gardens. And I see Doug Grable, Jeremiah Martin, the older men in our congregation kneeling down beside a bench with a homeless guy. Terrible. They were willing to get out of their comfort zone. And God really touched their hearts. I had groups where I had kids in the back crying because of what they saw. And it changes their lives. That's one reason I like doing mission work. Another one is I really like to walk out my faith. And in uh, James 2, 17 and 18, it says this. If I had my glasses on, I could find it. In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by actions, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Hmm. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith with what I what I do. Deeds works does not save us, but being saved requires works. The uh, I just heard it this week. Someone was saying, talking through their life. I was going to do this, but then I didn't, and now I'm 30, and then it keeps going through, and finally it says. And then I died. And then I realized I never lived. For me, I'm excited about getting up in the morning. What does God have for me to do today? And that is totally opposite of what I was when I was a teenager. But when you are uh, willing to give out, then God can use you. I asked a lady down in Honduras, I said, what do you, what, what do you think when us Americans came? Because you bring me hope. You bring us hope. I work with NBS also. And the back of our shirts on NBS, it says, Rebuilding Hope. In Honduras, it's not rebuilding hope. It's bringing them hope. And that's one reason that really keeps me going back to Honduras is to bring them hope. And the lady that said that to me, it wasn't because we did a um, evangelistic meeting. It's because I concreted her floor and we helped her child stay in school. And we did the practical things that Jesus asked us to do, the cup of cold water. Just helping out in the little things. And that's when she said, you bring me hope. You can be doing that everywhere. And it's just a, just like you said to your neighbor. Just like you said. All that opportunities that were missed because you didn't say hi to them and start up a conversation and let God open the door and share with them. So don't one day I'm dead and I never live. Give it to the Lord. Give it to the Lord and let Him excite your days. I wanted to just share a little bit about some of the things that I have done through missions with Bob. Um, when we, I just say that missions is a lifestyle. It's been a lifestyle for us since we were pretty much early married. And um, one of the scriptures that sticks out to many of us is Mark 16, go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. So we're all called to be ambassadors for Christ, the one that tells somebody the good news. Um, and 
as we were growing up, we had the four little children. One of the ways that um, I was able to share the good news was inviting the neighbor children to go along, just as we've been talking about it. So sharing the good news in our neighborhood. Invite the neighbor children along to church, take them to church, and allow them to um, receive training at the church and, um, and learn the good news. Have that planted in their hearts. When we were, when we're, as we're growing older, there are so many seasons and so many ways that we can um, share the good news that we can share with others. One other way is right now, my Bob and I are reading a book, and our grandson and his mom are reading a book, and so it's called, um, it's about the Holy Spirit, and it's um, a book on the Holy Spirit. And as they read it, and as we're reading it, when we drive to soccer practice. We can talk about it. What's sticking out in your mind? How is God talking to you in that book? So there's many ways, just in our families, that we can reach out and um, share the good news in our families. So it's our neighborhoods, it's in our families, and in Deuteronomy it says, fix these words of mine in your heart. Um, fix them on your mind. Teach them to your children. Talk about them when you sit down when you are walking along the road or when you're driving in a car. All those ways are ways that we can share that good news with others. Another way is that when we're in Honduras, um, we have been building relationships over the past couple years, as Bob shared, with um, maybe a concrete floor or clean water and that kind of thing, which has given us an opportunity now to go back and one way um, is that we, I have a, a bilingual devotional book that's in Spanish and it's in English, bilingual Bible. And we can um, take that book and read a Bible verse, read the scripture that goes with it, read the thoughts. And the Holy Spirit does an amazing, just opens up conversations. He opens up um, opportunities, just sharing hers. Um, you know, one lady will share that, um, shared that she had to leave her home. She had to run away with her children because her husband had been murdered. Another woman, um, she shared that um, um, that, um, yeah, just many of those kind of experiences. One was that a woman um, had to leave home because her father was abusive. So at 10 years old, she went to work in a factory and um, live in that factory. And we were able to just listen, and the tears are running, and that's just an opportunity to let the Holy Spirit, let them speak, and then you have an opportunity to pray and give the hope of Jesus in those different situations. So regardless of where we're at, we're raising our children, you know, if we're raising grandchildren or being with grandchildren, or overseas in the mission field, there are just so many opportunities to share the love of Christ with others. And the Holy Spirit just opens the door and he gives us those chances to pray. And we just praise him for that. So I guess that's what I'd like to share today. Thank you all for sharing. I uh, kind of forgot I'm so preaching here. So um, you're ministering to me a lot. So thank you. Yeah. God is alive and moving in the whole world. You just got to show up. Be faithful. There are people every day with an enemy at their gates, just like Kila. And they're in need of saving. And the, the enemy at their gates is the devil. And the Savior they need is Jesus. So we've got to cultivate that willingness. To stick our necks out. Come out of our comfort zone, wherever we're at, wherever God will call us to go with it. And if we're going to bring Jesus to them, first we have to care, right? It's like David looked at the people in Kilo and he cared. we got to cultivate that caring. Jesus says in Matthew 5, 43 through 47. I know I might need help again. There, thank you. You have heard it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. That you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good. And 
it sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so. Jesus is saying here, if you just love those who have something to offer you, love those who love you back, even public sinners, prostitutes, the biggest sinners, public sinners you can think of, they do the same, right? Everyone loves someone who loves them or has something to offer them. But we're called to be sons of the Most High God. Sons and daughters redeemed by the blood of Jesus. Follow that example of Jesus leaving everything for people who have nothing to offer him. Right? And when we reflect on that love that we freely receive, we can freely give that by the fruits of the Spirit working through us. And so I hope we're willing to stick our necks out for those right next to us or those across the seas. And it's a, it's a great task, monumental task, and yet we just have a small part to play. So most of you probably know I enjoy fishing quite a bit, and uh, Jay Meyer shared a story with me about a month ago about fishing. Was it your granddaughter or your great-granddaughter? Your great-great-granddaughter, is that what you said? No. <laughs> your great-granddaughter. Um, so she came up and, and said, uh, I want to I go fishing. He said, all right. So they found a fishing pole and went and found some worms. And he put it on the, he got the fishing pole, he got the, fish, the worms, put it on the hook, cast it out there. He handed the pole to his great-granddaughter and it wasn't long and she had something on She said, I, I got one, I got one. So she hands the pole back to him and he reels it in takes it off the hook and hands it to her. She said, I caught one. Jay being Jay says, now wait a minute. Who caught the fish? I caught the fish. He says, now who, who put the worm on the hook? You did. And who cast it out there? You did. And who reeled it back in? You did. Who caught the fish? I did. Right? <laughs> and I think it's kind of like that in, in missions. Like, God's working in their hearts. God's Showing people that what they're looking for, what they're missing, is Him. God gives us words to speak. We just got to let them fall out. And then God does the convicting, and God draws people to Himself. We just have to show up. We just have to go across the street or across the world. Just be faithful with what God's placed in front of us. So I'd like to ask the worship team to come back up. And my challenge for us this week is to ask Jesus not when or if, but where he would have us go with the good news. The gospel. That all have fallen short of the glory of God. We've all sinned. We're sentenced to hell. But there is a great God who sent his only son to come and to die for us. We have nothing to offer him, but he came to give himself up for us. To redeem us. And so we can take that good news of Jesus to those around us. Maybe it's across the street. Maybe it's in the prisons. Maybe it's in Honduras or across, across the world. But people need Jesus. And we can go and take him to him. Introduce people to Jesus. So let's go boldly with that good news this week. The worship team is going to lead us in a song and close us out. With this boldness of being willing to stick our necks out to those who have nothing to offer us, Jesus says in Matthew 28, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, followers of Jesus, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So part of that command is baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So if you've never made that commitment, that public pro proclamation of that turning around from sin and turning towards Jesus by way of baptism, we'd love to, to do that. We'd love to walk with you through that. And so uh, if you feel the Spirit leading in that way to take that step of obedience, uh, Ben or myself or any of the elders would love to talk with you afterwards. But let's, this week, and going forward, be willing, be looking for opportunities to take the good news of Jesus to those who need it. Be willing to stick our necks out, knowing that Jesus is right there with us. We don't go alone, but we go by His Spirit in us. So let's pray. 
Dear Jesus, we thank you for looking on us, seeing that we have nothing to offer you, but you gave yourself for us the highest price to redeem us so that we can have a relationship with you and that we can be with you forever. Lord, you know there are many, even many around us, close to us, that don't know you or haven't submitted to you as Lord. Lord, you're calling. We trust that. We pray that you'll be moving in there. And that you'll show us where you would have us go with the gospel. Your good news, Jesus. That you'll give us opportunities. And we pray in faith that when we ask for opportunities, that you will give them. And I pray for courage to go boldly. Know you are doing the work. Give us courage to be faithful. Lord, I pray for your people this week. That you'll be with them in the good times and the hard. That you'll fill them with your Holy Spirit. That your fruit will abound. And that many will come to know you through your people living as your redeemed children. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go in peace and feel free to stay in fellowship with us with over some ice cream celebrating what the Lord's been doing uh, or building that. Thank you.